today. Jason Theodore is the founder and creative consultant at morebetterdifferent.org, where he helps companies and individuals unlock their uh, creative potential. I, I have to say I'm a huge fan and longtime follower of Jason and many, many an art and design student uh, here in Toronto has been exposed to his uh, remarkable frameworks and uh, thinking and systems around uh, creativity. So we're really, really thrilled to have him here with us today. Please give a huge warm welcome to Jason Theodore. Thank you so much, Christine. And welcome everyone again to Spotlight on AI. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Today, I'm gonna try something a little bit different and I'm going to talk about the seven habits for highly effective prompting. Just something I've been working on for what feels like the last couple of years, but it's really only been a few months since uh, everything keeps rapidly changing in this AI universe that we live in. Um, basically, these seven habits will allow you to have access to what I call an executive assistant coach, which is essentially somebody that can help you do more, be better, and think different. Um, so my name is Jason Theodore, and my friends call me J-Ted, and my enemies call me Jason the Odor, but hopefully you'll pick the former by the time this presentation is over. Um, as Christine mentioned, I'm uh, a creative consultant for morebetterdifferent.org, and I'm also an executive creative director, uh, director of creativity, strategy, and experience design. And my entire career has been at the intersection of creativity, design, and technology, whether that's you know, building feature content for General Motors, launching new runware for Nike, or helping TD develop a better trading app. Um, while the beard and hair in this image are way too styly, I have to say this looks surprisingly like me. I used a prompt called Young Bob Dylan with Large Beard. And uh, it worked slightly better than the previous prompt I had tried, which was a skinnier Jack Black. But anyway, prompts are everything. And we're not gonna talk about mid-journey today. We're actually gonna be talking about, well, we used to just say chat GPT, but now we're calling it conversational AI because there's a lot of other different uh, things on the market now. But let's get into it. So, why is this important? Why do you need to understand the seven or habits? Um, Pew survey results from earlier this year showed that 14% of Americans have tried ChatGPT, even though 65% of them have heard of it. 14% um, have actually sat down, logged in, opened it up, and played with it a little bit. And of that 14%, um, roughly a third of those found it very or extremely useful. And I have to say that that means that only 5%, and this is of Americans, but it's probably very similar in Canada, um, only 5% are using this to their advantage. Um, to be fair, not all of them are going to be knowledge workers or creative professionals, but that means that if you learn these seven habits, you will definitely have an advantage over uh, roughly 95% of the population. Um, I don't know about you, but I kind of like those odds. So it's really hard to believe where we are right now. A year ago, we were probably arguing about whether Alexa or Siri was faster at uh, setting a timer or settling a bet on how old Harrison Ford is. Um, and things move very slowly until they don't. So today we're basically one step closer to artificial general intelligence or AGI. Um, that's where a computer appears to be as smart as a human. And then of course, after that, who knows, we get into super intelligence, et cetera. That's what everybody's worried about right now and talking about. But today we're just going to focus on, um, the conversational intelligence. And, and there's a few other players that have moved into the into the marketplace other than just ChatGPT, which launched, hard to believe, but it was just last November. So it hasn't even been out for that long. It's already upgraded to version four, ChatGPT four is out, but also Google Bard is available. And um, 
Anthropics Claude is available. And even if you're in Canada, there's a tricky way that uh, you can actually get access to these by by subscribing to a VPN and logging in from the United States. And um, there's also Bing Chat, which is sort of basically ChatGPT4. Um, and then there's also some free ones that have come out that you have to install and it takes a lot of technical know-how. But if you know what you're doing, um, you can install Meta's Llama or you can install Stability AI's Free Willy. Um, and then there's also Inflection AI, which has launched this insane application called Pi, which stands for, I think, Personal Intelligence. And it's basically a talking AI that sounds like such a real person that you almost feel like you're in the movie Her. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of stuff on the market today. I'm basically going to focus on ChatGPT4, uh, but also you can also use Bard and Claude. Anyway, how do we take advantage of this five percent? How do we how do we how do we find these tools very or extremely useful? So the first thing that we need to understand is that we need to know what we want. Um, it's easy to throw random crap at a chatbot and marvel at its ability to, you know, dance like a monkey. And but um, you know, you you can ask it to write a poem about Oppenheimer in the in the style of Dr. Zeus. But who cares, right? What is, so what? Um, what are you actually trying to do? You have to you have to ask yourself as a creative professional, what am I actually trying to accomplish here? What am I actually trying to to make and to create? What do I want? What do I need? Um, and format is the most basic, but it can also be the most complex of these habits. You need to to tweak your intention. So a few years ago, I took a course from Jared Spool. He's you know uh, he's got a company called User Interface Engineering. Um, they do workshops on UX and UI, et, et cetera. But I loved what he had to say about design. He said, design is a rendering of intent. In other words, the manifestation of your intention. And that's exactly what you need to know when you get into these chatbots. Um, you have to be literal and poetic. You have to be constrictive and constructive. You have to be open-minded, but within a defined box. So to describe your intention to the bot, and I'm going to call them bots. Um, if you want to describe your intention to the bot, to your, to your executive assistant coach, uh, you need to be pretty pointed. Um, how are they going to manifest your, your, your concept? There's a, there's a really, really, you know, there's very simplistic ways of doing this. I almost end every single prompt now with this simple, uh, piece called use markdown for clarity and organization, because I want the results to look nice. I want them to be organized. I want them to have some formatting. I want to have headers and bullet points and et cetera. But if you want to go even past that, there's a funny little trick that you can take, which I'll get into. Um, it's actually habit seven, but we'll get to that later. But you can ask it to help you with the format. So in complex ways, you can make your results far more targeted. Um, explain the type of document that you need so that the bot understands its form and function. Um, explain the length that you need even though, as we'll explain a little bit later, it's hard for bots to quite understand the length of things or the words, the number of words. Um, explain how deep or shallow that the bot needs to go when it is um, doing its reasoning. Uh, that's called Bloom's Taxonomy. So it's sort of built into this prompt, but Bloom's Taxonomy deals with, okay, am I, am I just trying to remember something or am I trying to explain something? Um, or all the way up to, you know, analyzing or evaluating and judging something to, you know, creating something from scratch. So Bloom's taxonomy is kind of built into this prompt. But when you're getting into the format, ask, um, tell it, I'm creating a document. Describe the document. Is it an email? Is it a birthday card? Is it uh, a treatise, a, a thesis, um, a manifesto? 
uh, a job interview, job description. Um, and then please ask, oh, it's very important to say please, because, you know, when these things get to super intelligent phase, um, and you want them to know that you've been very so use please, please ask me everything you need to know in order to create this document, including its exact type, how long it should be, and which of Bloom's taxonomy we should focus on. So when you use some, a prompt like this, um, it'll actually ask you what it needs to know so that it can do a much better job for you. So moving on to habit two, um, chain of thought. Uh, you know, when we're thinking about, this is about showing your work, but when, when you think about creativity, um, creativity, lateral thinking, um, a meandering mind, daydreaming, et cetera, when you're, when you're trying to find an answer or get to an answer, these things take us off the beaten path. They take us off the sort of default straight and narrow. Um, and they take us somewhere new and they take us sometimes in a really convoluted, odd way to a eureka moment or a conclusion or insight. And when you're looking back, after you've reached an, an insight, when you look back in hindsight, it's easy to uh, to look back from the solution that you've come to and to think that it's super obvious and logical, especially to someone that you explain it to. They're like, oh, well, of course that makes sense, but they haven't gone through all that meandering. So that, in a sense, that's a fallacy. Um, I love this quote from Ed, Edward de Bono, one of the sort of grandfathers of, of creativity and lateral thinking. But the steps to a great creative idea are never the same as the steps back because um, now you know the answer and you, you take a shortcut to bring people to you know, to bring people along for the ride, to bring people along to the conclusion. Anyway, long story short, the path from A, your challenge, to B, the solution is different than the path back from B to A. And this is why we need chatbots to explain their thinking processes. Like chain of thought is essentially um, so that we can understand both paths to and from the answer and then decide as creative curators uh, which you know, whether to, to explore that path further or not. Um, this prompt is extraordinarily uncomplicated. Uh, it's really, and, but I, I basically use it uh, on almost every prompt that I do. Um, you can use it in, in slightly different formats so that it's a little more uh, prescriptive. But this one, explain your answer by breaking it down into detailed steps describing each decision point along the way to ensure we arrive at a most accurate and effective answer possible. Um, this way, every link in the thought process can be explored. We know how the bot got there. You can also just say, explain your answer step by step. That's another, that's another sort of faster way of, of adding it to just about every prompt that you write if you want to know how it got to where it got. So that's habit number two. Habit three is role play. So there's a there's a great article by Alex Morrell called The Age of Average. If you haven't read it, it's fascinating. He talks about how just about everything globally looks and feels the same when you you know you you scratch the surface. Uh, the interiors of every coffee shop looks the same. All the cars look the same. All the websites and apps and Instagram influencers, everything else just all look very, very much the same. So why should we participate in the age of average when we really want to be different? We want to differentiate. Um, that's what gets, uh, that's what should get attention. Um, if you don't specify who should respond when you're talking to ChatGPT or talking to Bard or talking to Claude. If you don't tell it who it should be, uh, what perspective it's coming from, essentially, um, then you'll get answers from the bump of the bell curve. Uh, there'll be default answers. The, they're like the middle bits of human knowledge, the median, the medium, uh, median, I should say. Um, you've heard the medium is a message when you're dealing with chatbots and you don't tell it who it should be, 
essentially the median is the message that you get back. It's just the middle of the road. So, so uh, invite someone to the table that's more specific. Uh, pick a specific title. And then when you're asking the chatbot to take on that title or that persona, why stop there? Why not ask them to be an expert or a world expert or world class or the best in their field? Because essentially that's the way to start exploring the long tail and get more interesting deep cuts of information that it's going to feed back to you. Then you can be the generalist, right? You can be the conductor of the orchestra of experts. Um, and uh, that way you're going to get a more interesting and nuanced response. So here's an example. I need help with X. You are a world-class expert in this. List some of your possible titles so I can be more specific during our conversation. Oh, this is, this is if you need help. Um, you know, sometimes we don't know what title uh, we should give something, especially if it's a, an area that we don't quite understand or we're not super experts in. So if you need help getting ultra specific, you can use this, this type of prompt and the AI will be very happy to help you out. So you, you say, I need help with this task. You're an expert in this, list some possible titles. Um, and then you can then you can apply the title and say you are a world class expert, blank chef. Uh, help me to write a menu plan for for my week. And then you've just unlocked the first big step to getting the most out of generative AI. You've gone from essentially a, or let's continue this cooking metaphor, but you've gone from using a butter knife to using a samurai sword. So that's habit number three. Habit number four, five, and six, they sort of all go together. Uh, I call this the holy trinity of prompting. There's entire articles about this using tree of thought. Um, it works very similar to design thinking in that, uh, or the double diamond idea, even though there's sort of only one here. But the idea is that you use, di you use divergent thinking, uh, then some analysis, and then converge to a final conclusion. So how does this work? So while chain of thought can help you understand how you got to your destination, tree of thought is kind of like Yelp or TripAdvisor or like Google Maps in that it gives you uh, multiple options to choose from. So multiple ideas, multiple perspectives, multiple paths and, and um, places to go. Uh, there's another great quote from Edward de Bono where he says, if you never generate alternatives, then you never have a choice when it comes to your, your ideas. So why not, you know, you've got, why stop at one world-class expert when you could have, uh, you could have a panel of experts, you could have an entire personal think tank, you could have your own creative council that you consult with. Basically, tree of thought is basically about branching. I said basically a lot. Um, but here's an example. So where you can get some really great divergent ideas. And uh, I say three in here, but you can pick as many responses as you like. I find three or four is, is, is about right um, because you, you avoid analysis paralysis. With these bots, they can give you so many answers sometimes that you just get buried uh, in the mediocrity often. But uh, too many choices can sometimes be worse than one. But anyway, stick with three or four. Write, the, here's the prompt. So write three different responses. Response A is from the perspective of, and then pick a role. Response B is from the perspective of, pick your second role. And response C is from the perspective of, and pick your third role. Now, what's fascinating is that I accidentally pasted this into chat GPT for, and um, and I forgot to change the roles, and it just assigned them. It was like, oh, cool, okay, we need a rule, uh, a role A, a, a role B, and a role C, and it made them up. But they were very specific to the kind of thing I was asking. I thought, oh, that's cool. Um, you can let the chatbot pick your experts if you uh, if if you're curious about about where it's going to go. So it's just that's even another way of playing tree of thought. 
But um, sometimes the bots get enamored with their own words and uh, and they start spewing out hallucinations, they're called, uh, but with enormous confidence, which is why this is so dangerous sometimes, because they will talk about things, they'll make up words, they'll make up facts, they'll make up, they'll make up laws, they'll make up, you name it. Um, and they'll do it with such an extraordinary amount of assuredness that it's very, very important that you check it, that you check them. Um, they also work in a specific way where once they start to um, to do their their generative thing, the transformer thing, where they're it, it's essentially like super advanced predictive text. Um, once they start, they don't know exactly where they're going to end up. So. And it's an easy. There's an easy way to test this, which is basically to ask them um, this prompt right here. Write a short paragraph about creativity. Put the exact number of words at the end of the paragraph in brackets. So I tested this on, um, you know, they're writing a paragraph. Shouldn't they know how many words there there are? It's not hard, but no, they they are never accurate. They get close, but they never know exactly how many words it, that they're even going to say. So it's crucial to keep the robot egos in check uh, and ask them to critique their own work. And um, this not only helps with accuracy, but further and deeper discovery. Uh, so it's it's like working with an, an expert editor or a creative director or a teacher uh, where you need to look at what has been created and ask yourself, um, how it could possibly be improved. So here's an example of asking a bot to critique its own work. This one works really well for me, especially if you're using it in, in this sort of Trinity order where you've already got the branch of thought, you've asked for three experts opinion, and then you say to it, well, now you're a researcher tasked with investigating these responses or arguments, list any flaws, issues, or faulty logic in your previous answers. And then you can, I mean, you can paste it in again, or, if it's uh, in sequence, it'll remember, and it'll give you some amazing responses. It'll actually look at the pros and cons, um, and it'll break down the logic because it gets to look at it again. When it's predicted it uh, or created it in the, the very first time, it's not reflecting. It's not thinking any more about it since its first time. And then it might go, oh, you know what? I could improve this. This could actually be better. And then find the final part of that of that trilogy is judgment. Um, really, this should be called assessment, I think, because it's it's about rating and ranking. It's about weighing the pros and cons. But judgment sounds more badass, I guess. Um, but this is where you grade your work. I say your work; it's really the bot's work. But um, and at the same time, when you're looking at judging it um, again with De Bono, he, he's just He's just uh, thought a lot about this, but he, Edward Damano didn't believe in, in right and wrong answers. Um, he said that even the worst response has something that he called movement value. And in other words, um, a provocation to help move an idea along to propel it or knock it in a new direction. Uh, that is just uh, basically a stepping stone to, to something else. Which is, a, which is a really positive and fantastic way of, of uh, you know, uh, looking at it. It's like yes and in a brainstorming session. But um, judgment assessment is just another way of looking at things and giving you a new perspective. Um, so it's a, it's a great way to focus things down and to start the convergent process. You know, you've done the divergence with the branching. Now you do the convergence with the judging and then at some point because you have to make a decision at some point to to move forward so six is judgment um you can leave out the decision matrix in this little <laughs> long prompt here but uh, if you don't want to make it too complicated um, you'll definitely want to add chain of thought to this prompt i think just to say explain the step by step 
because then you'll get a better idea of, of how it's thinking about what it's judging. But here's the essential prompt. You are a resolver tasked with decoding which of the responses from your previous research is the best. Make this decision to the best of your knowledge through the use of a comprehensive decision matrix. You don't have to add that. Um, then improve or combine the results into the best possible final answer. And it's really interesting to see what it does and, and what it comes up with, what it chooses as being one of the best and why. Uh, again, just another tool. And then finally, we have habit seven, mimicry. Um, there's an impressive hack uh, that I saw where an author pasted examples of their own work into, into ChatGPT4 and asked them to analyze it. And uh, I think she said, you know, write a detailed description of my tone and manner in the form of a, of a brand guideline, essentially, um, and write that as a, as a prompt. And then she copied this back in uh, to the bot to say, use this prompt when writing so that it always sounds like me. And it sort of works. It's, it's, a, it's a cool sort of hack and an interesting way of, of trying to get the bot to sound more like yourself or more like a brand or whatever it is that you're trying to make it sound like. But um, it's not quite that simple. And I also firmly believe that not doing the hard work and the deep thinking and you know the struggling, it leaves you mentally atrophied and, and weaker for it. And, and I think that it's important that we struggle through uh, our own creative thoughts and voices, but um, well, because if you don't want to be replaced, you have to make yourself irreplaceable. And for that, you need to practice creativity. Um, so here's the prompt that I use and I call it mimicry, but I discovered this hack in uh, a moment of inspiration after reading about someone using ChatGPT for prepping for a job interview. And I thought, well, why can't I ask the bot to ask me questions about everything or anything? Um, why can't it consistently interview me like a, like a ghostwriter would and, and, um, and ask me all the things that it, that it needs to know before it writes something up uh, instead of having it make up everything, ask me all the questions, ask me all the things, ask me all the things. Um, so after some tweaking and prompt smithing, I came up with this. And honestly, this is my go-to. It, it, it has never let me down. The questions it asks are in incredible, uh, especially if you combine this with role play and you tell it to be a, you know, a, a specific expert in something. Um, but what's really powerful about this is that you provide the context, you provide the details, you provide the tone and manner, and then it just takes your answers and pours it into the format that you stated uh, in habit one, where you know where you pick the format that you want it to be, and then um, and then you have something amazing that sounds like you, but way better organized and formatted. Uh, so this, this prompt is kind of like magic. Ask me everything you need to know before writing an effective document. Ask me one question at a time before moving on to the next. After I've answered the final question, incorporate my answers into a concise document. Now, I find it really, really important to ask it to ask me one question at a time before moving on for two reasons. One is, who wants a giant list of 10 things, you feel like you're you're taking a, a, a high school exam. Who wants a list, a big list of questions? Second, if it asks you the questions one at a time, it actually understands and processes your answers and then will ask you more intelligent follow-up questions. Uh, so mimicry, um, ask me everything is basically what it should be called, but a fantastic, fantastic little tool. So the seven habits for highly effective prompting are fairly simple, right? There's, there's no brain surgery here, uh, rocket surgery, as they say, but here they are. Format, right? Explain your intent. Chain of thought, show your work. Understand how you got to the response. Role play, 
ask an expert, get a more pointed and less generic response. Tree of thought, expand your work, um, give yourself more options, bring a panel of experts, go for the divergence. Reflection, and I spell it with an X because it's more fun, but, uh, and, and it's uh, an old antique word, which is fun to mix with, uh, with all these modern AIs. But reflection is check and critique your work. And then judgment is grade and assess your work, get, um, get it to converge so that you start making decisions on what to go forward with. And then lastly, mimicry, which is use your words, sound more like yourself. Um, just a, a final note, generative AI is an augmentation for creativity. It's not a replacement for creativity um, because you are the one that has the intention and the bot is just trying to help you manifest it. So um, that's my talk. And a, a huge thank you to everyone um, for logging into Spotlight AI today. It was an amazing pleasure to share this with you as always. And I sincerely hope uh, it takes your prompt crafting to the next level, as well as your ability to do more, think better and be different. I think I said that wrong before. But <laughs> um, so I also teach this as a course. So real quick, here's my plug. Um, we'll be working on sharpening these kinds of prompts even more for your specific benefit. And everyone here today has a 33% discount. If you're interested, um, the live classes are through maven.com. And um, you can follow this QR code or go to morebetterdifferent.org um, and get $100 off using FITC23. Um, thanks again, everyone. And I'm, I'm uh, very excited and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. That was uh, incredible. I have... Uh, thousands of questions. I want to be in your okay. course. Uh, <laughs> um, amazing. So we are going to do uh, some Q&A uh, now with Jason for, for about 15 minutes. I'm just going to pop in. I see there lots of people have questions. So I'm going to start with Good. theirs uh, before I uh, selfishly. There are people here. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Lots of great uh, questions. Um, I, I think this question is a really good one. Um, it's from uh, 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 Kirsten, and uh, Kirsten is asking, when dealing with an unfamiliar subject, how can one check the accuracy? How do you know if the AI is messing with you? Well, the first and obvious one is to ask it to double check, right? To do to do the, uh, the self-analysis, the reflection. Um, the second one is good old fashioned Google. I mean, it's still a useful tool uh, to, to go and actually find out and double check if something is true. Um, now to say that, oh, it's on the internet, so it's true is, uh, you know, a little bit of a misnomer, but um, it's still possible to find a source that you trust, especially an academic source, uh, to find out if, if some facts or elements are working. So you can't, you can't trust it. You can, you can never trust it 100%, just like you can't trust anything 100% until you actually do a little bit of due diligence. Can you ask it to cite its sources? Yes and no. Um, it's getting better at that. I think that there, it depends on the tool that you're using. So if you use, um, Bing chat, for instance, it will cite sources and it'll give you links. I think chat GPT four is starting to do that or was doing that when it had the browser enabled, but people are using that to cheat, to get around like, uh, to get around, um, gated information, <laughs> um, paid pay gates, but, uh, some do and some don't. That's all I can say. And, and, uh, the ones that don't, when you ask them for citations, they're not always accurate because they're basing the answers on uh, on on older information that might have changed, like links and things like that. Right, right. Um, I, have, I have another question here. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any real world examples that you can kind of quickly pull out just to show where these seven habits um, have been applied? Um. 
<laughs> I now use them on just about everything that I that I create. Uh, I use it to help me edit things. I use it to help me explore ideas. If I'm writing, um, you know, my own marketing material, if I'm writing something for for LinkedIn, uh, I think I used it to help me write a slightly better bio or short version of the bio for for this uh, for this conference. I mean, you can essentially use it for just about anything, but. When it comes to, say, creating a bio, bios are really hard to write, especially for me. I think most people find them difficult. But now you've, you know, I take, I would take everything from LinkedIn, copy it into one of these chat bots, say, you are uh, an expert editor, biographer, <laughs> and, and an expert in LinkedIn. And, you know, write me a, a short blurb that summarizes this, but that, you know, for a creative audience and and it'll do that um and then you can use some of these other tools right to try it try it in three different tones try it try writing one version yeah. for creative professionals try writing one version for potential clients and uh, and see what it comes up with it's it's basically like i said it's like a creative assistant coach so the creative assistant or executive assistant coach i should say the executive assistant is somebody that you can uh, give all sorts of interesting tasks to and see what they come back with. And then your job is to curate them, to, to judge them, to, to edit them and play with it. Yeah. Uh, not to just take it at, you know, as being finished. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think actually uh, there was a, a great example of one of the kind of the divergence prompts on your website and I, I did uh, try it out and um, it worked really well for me. So I would encourage everyone to uh, not only go <laughs> back through the presentation and try some of the prompts, but check out uh, Jason's website as well. There was a, there's some really good prompts on there um, that use these seven habits. Yeah. And more. Uh, yeah. There yeah. there's, I, I use it for often. Um, I didn't put it in this presentation because there just wasn't enough time, but things like, random word or how yes. might how might we uh, using random words to there's a prompt to use a random word to just inject it into an idea that you have and apply brand new attributes and it, it and it comes up with some crazy concepts or versions of, of things it's it's a great way to to ideate and then how might we is just like ideo's way of um of focusing. So when we get into format and intention, it's like, okay, how can I get really, really specific about the question that I'm asking so that my answer is, you know, more appropriate. So those are, yeah, those are on, on my website. Um, let's see another a few more questions in here. Um, this is a great question from Pedro. How often do you uh, feel the need to prime the AI with context or data or any other content? I mean, I think based on what you just said, the, the answer is often. Um, but um, how does that sort of prepare it to better help you when you kind of prime it? With it's funny because I'm kind of lazy in the fact, that, in, in the sense that I I often don't want to do a lot of priming, but it depends on how depends on how much work I want to get out of it. Right? How much work I put in is how much work I'll get out. Um, gold in, gold out, as they say. Uh, but yeah, I, I I also don't tweak things a lot. Like I'll, I'll use GPT. If you use um, OpenAI's platform and you subscribe to, to ChatGPT for, you can get into the OpenAI playground and you can change things like temperature and you can make all sorts of creative adjustments. Um, but I again i'm i'm sort of lazy in the sense that i just look at each one of these bots as as like a specific type of personality like somebody that like like an executive assistant that you would hire so bard has a different personality than claude has a different personality than chat gpt4 which they need a new name for because it's just not, not very <laughs> personal but um and then in terms of priming it like yeah i usually do zero shots which is which is, you know, no, I don't give any examples, but if you do give it examples, um, it will, it will do a better job. It will definitely do a better job instead of 
fighting with it for a long period of time. It's actually worth the effort. A um, couple more questions here. I, I see Katie has a question just about sort of how the growth of AI is affecting the, um, the art community. And I, I just want to kind of build out on that and talk a little bit about uh, design, art and design, um, creativity in general. And you, you mentioned sort of this idea of kind of like the rendering of intent. Um, and it, it's always top of mind for me as a designer that uh, not all intent can be articulated in words. And we talk a lot in design about sort of embodied cognition. I think Kevin Kelly says, you know, we're tool thinkers. We we kind of think in our and with our environments. And I, I'm just wondering what it's doing to us as creatives to sort of having to boil down our intent into words. They seem such an ineffective medium. Uh, I, think, I, I think that'll change. I think that as these tools become more multimodal. I, th I think BARD is becoming multimodal. Mm. Uh, so, and, and by multimodal, I mean that it it can see as well as, you yeah. know, it can see and hear as well as read. So you could show it videos, you could show it pictures, you could, uh, you could upload sounds, um, charts and graphs and that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there's nothing is going to replace doing things nothing is going to replace the the act of creation by a human being for themselves i mean you get a certain um feeling of gratification of humanity by by you know putting a pen to paper sometimes and and drawing a little scribble um you're not going to get that feeling from something like a conversation, conversational AI, but it might tweak something. It might it might inspire something, and it depends. Um, it depends what kind of rabbit hole you want to go down. But I would say is that regardless of what kind of cr creative person you are, uh, it's very useful for all sorts of things that we still need to do to exist in this world, which is to make money to sell ourselves to promote ourselves and i think for people that find that difficult uh, which i can definitely relate to these chatbots can actually help you to articulate yourself mm. to others right um i think this this is a similar question um another question from uh, uh kirsten you you spoke of receiving answers and content in markdown format can ChatGPT ever control other apps or are we limited at pasting and text output? I mean, I think you sort of started to talk about the future um, evolution of, of different types of inputs, but I, I wonder if you can tell, tell us any more about that. Yeah. If you're, if you're willing to pay 20 bucks a month, um, which sounds like a lot, but compared to hiring a, a, an assistant, um, it's nothing. Um, with, chat gpt plus you have plugins which allow it co to connect to, to things like databases spreadsheet apps etc you you can start creating plotting charts and graphs and and um there there's all sorts of options and they keep adding not only new plugins but uh but new features and abilities uh, almost every couple of weeks so yeah, it's it's getting to the point where you can get far past Markdown. Uh, I watched a video yesterday about somebody that's using it to write MIDI music, and it and it converts things like <laughs> all of Bach's music, for instance, or or all of uh, whatever whatever music you want, and then saying, "Write me some MIDI in this style," and then mm -hmm. bringing that back to their synthesizer and. Uh, and, and playing around with it. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Oh, they were doing jazz too. It was, it was hmm. some fascinating stuff. So yes, <laughs> that's the answer. There's, there's all sorts of other things than, than uh, Markdown. Right. Um, here's another uh, interesting question along the same lines from Shelley. How do they handle other languages, not English? And I'm thinking not only other languages, not English, but ASL, for example, I guess there's. Yeah, it doesn't. 
the bot doesn't understand English. Uh, the, the, it just is trained on a bunch of information that it sees patterns. So um, if it's trained in every language, all language, I mean, they're using it to, mm. to uh, they have been using these AIs to understand um, like some Rosetta Stone type things, like different cuneiform and, and other mm. Uh, other patterns that they haven't been able to crack um, where the, this, the pattern recognition of a pre-trained uh, or, or a generative pre-trained transformer is, is what makes it so magical that it, it, it can see patterns and then predict outputs from those patterns. So um, yeah, every single language will be available. I, I don't know how many languages it can do already, but it's definitely more than just English. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this is a kind of an interesting question from Steve, and it just uh, reminds me in terms of what you said about it's kind of like having a hiring an assistant, right? Um, and I, I think we would be very patient with a human assistant. We would know we need to train them <laughs> and we need to like, you know, uh, spend a fair bit of time with them to get them uh, up and running on all of our processes and our thinking. But uh, uh, Steve is asking, how often are you starting a new or, or a fresh chat or times when the bot has just like gone in the wrong direction? Depends how long of a conversation you want to have, because they mm. do have a limited sort of brain capacity. There's, you know, you hit you hit a, a limit on the number of tokens. Um, tokens are just a fancy way of, of sort of saying words, but it's a little bit it's a little bit of a different um, it, it's basically like the data around the words, um, but you hit a cap and then it can't really, it can't really understand you anymore. So there's different workarounds and there's fun ways to do this where uh, I'm, I'm playing with a concept right now where uh, it actually takes the conversation and continuously writes it to a text file, but not, not the full conversation uh, uh, an abridged, uh, sort of summary that it will be able to understand later. And I think a lot of people have been doing this so that, um, so they can have longer conversations and work through things like, like say uh, ideas for a novel with a bunch of details and characters and that where you, you, you want to keep getting into more and more and more detail, have it summarize things, copy that. Um, and then, repaste it into a chat so that it kind of knows where you left off. That's a, that's a cumbersome way to do it. I, I think um, it's sort of annoying. That'll all, that'll all be built in, you know, in the next six months. I think that, that those will all be options that'll be available. I mean, um, soon. We'll, yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say soon, you know, you'll be able to just set up a, a Google docs folder and you'll be able to have a conversation with it, right? Around all the data, whatever you put in there, that's yours. Maybe all your diary entries, maybe every essay you've ever written, maybe every bit of research that you've ever collected. Um, you'll be able to put it into a folder and talk to it. Yeah, I mean, we, we have uh, actually very, very little time left. Um, uh, maybe, uh, in fact, we probably want to wrap it up there. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Jason. There's so much there. Um, so many more questions I would love to ask. I would encourage everyone to uh, uh, definitely check out the recording. I, I should mention that if you came in halfway or you missed any of this, all of the sessions are being recorded. So um, you'll be able to uh, um, catch up. Um, thank you, Jason. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank everyone.